the last meeting of the semester, so it's Craig's last official MVZ lunch. What is it? And so although we're going to have a couple extra sem um, seminars in the next couple of weeks, this was the last official meeting. So some of us got together and the other various things uh -oh. celebrating uh -oh. Craig's departure after 10 years of leadership. Oh, this is probably going to be really embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> What's in there? But, um, Administrative just, memos. Right? <laughs> 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 but just to kind of mark the formal end of the well, thank you. The, what do I say? Hosting festivities? Uh, Go ahead. It's not embarrassing, don't worry. <laughs> well, I'll be saying more, much more, but it's been a real honor and a privilege to be part of this community and no one ever leaves the MVZ. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So. Okay. Ah, very good. Okay. It says I survived the MVC. <laughs> thank you, Arlen, and thank you, everyone. That's terrific. So, just so folks know, Craig's mentioned the other. He, I guess, you're around until mid June. Is that the plan? In and out. So, if people want to, you know, speak embarrass me further. Yeah, right. Individually, <laughs> yes. Thank you. That's really sweet. Did okay. I, I did want to tell people next Friday. At 3 o'clock is the yeah, MBZ right. photo. And I don't think I sent the announcement out to the undergrads, so I can send it. But everybody's Friday, welcome. This Friday, oh, wait, from Friday? Next Friday. Friday. Yeah, so not this yeah. one coming oh, up, but the oh, week fourth. after. Yeah, May 4th. So 3 o'clock, MBZ photo, so everybody should show up on the uh, north side. North side, yes. Right. And, then, and then there's also an announcement going out, but that following Saturday, the 5th, in the morning, there'll be a symposium here in Craig's honor. So please plan on attending that. It's actually in honor of the science week. Yes, I'm, I'm very honor. adamant about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's about our science. But I'm, I'm very moving. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, let me do some seminars. Uh, okay. Tomorrow, uh, IB seminar is Chelsea Specht from Plant Microbial Biology, talking about emerging complexity in the tropical gingers, flowers form and diversification. The ESPM on Monday is Andrew Hoffman uh, from the University of Michigan. I don't know the title. Uh, wildlife this Friday is Luke McCauley, who's a PhD student in ESPM, ranching for wildlife, economic returns, and habitat effects. Could you also mention Maria's talk tomorrow at GF lunch? Okay. Uh, so Maria Santos? Yeah, Maria Santos. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Talking tomorrow in GIF lunch at 1 o'clock? Yeah, 1 o'clock Thursday at 103. Malford, Malford. 103. Okay. Any others? All right, there's a lot happening. <laughs> And congratulations on the undergrads, and, and particularly those who are about to graduate. Mm -hmm. um, so, my pleasure to introduce Corey Tarwater. Uh, Corey's a postdoc with Steve Beisinger, uh, deeply involved in one of the longest running demographic studies of any tropical organism. It was written up some time ago in Science, highlighting this. Uh, something that Steve actually started when he was a graduate student at Michigan. Got so, mm his -hmm. way back. Uh, she's here until the end of this year and then moving on to a postdoc at UBC. Uh, cool, it's great to have you talking. And that's our time. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be talking about the timing of dispersal and survival, the timing of breeding, dispersal and survival in tropical birds. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about, there's basically two different parts to my talk. And both of them are going to be focusing on these two species that we've had some different long-term studies done on. So this top one is the western slaty ant shrike. I started this uh, study of the species uh, about 10 years ago in the tropical forest of Panama. And the second one was, is the green rumped parallettes. And the work was started back in 1980, 1988 by Steve Beisinger and colleagues. And they work on the parallettes in the Venezuelan Llanos. So the first part of the talk is going to be on the influence of natal traits on dispersal and juvenile survival in this tropical forest bird, the western slaty ant shrike. And the second part will be on selection on timing of breeding in this tropical savanna bird, the parallel. So although these seem like uh, very different topics, the thing that I'm, I'm attempting to weave together is this influence of natal traits or reproductive traits on individual fitness. So when you think about the top part, the part on the, the tropical forest bird, this is really from the offspring perspective. So how do these different natal, how do different natal traits influence offspring dispersal and offspring survival? Where well, the second part of the talk is more focused on from the parents' perspective. How do their different reproductive traits influence their reproduction and their own survival? So when I talk about natal reproductive traits for the purpose of this talk, I'm talking about date of birth, 
if we're thinking about it from the offspring perspective or the timing of breeding from the parent perspective. Offspring mass and number of siblings or number of young per breeding attempt, depending on what perspective you're talking about. So when we think about these different traits, there's been a number of studies showing that there can be these long-term effects of early conditions on individuals. So if you're talking about birds, you know, what happens in the nest can influence each of the subsequent stages. It can influence what they're like when they're juveniles, their dispersal behaviors, and what happens when they become adults and start breeding. And also what the different traits that the adults have can influence their offspring, obviously, and their own reproduction. So there's these things called silver spoon effects, where basically the idea if you're born into a good environment, you're more competitive, you're gonna have higher lifetime reproductive success. So there's just these, these long-term effects. In this case, I'm talking about birth date, offspring mass, and number of siblings, and whether or not these different traits influence dispersal of offspring, survival of parents and offspring, and the reproductive success of parents. <clears throat> so one thing besides, uh, one thing that brings these two species together as well is the fact that they're both in the tropics. So there's this idea that there's this latitudinal gradient in life history traits. With northern hemisphere temperate species being on the fast end where they have lower adult, adult survival, more young per breeding attempts, a larger clutch size, faster metabolism compared to these kind of these typical slow uh, tropical birds where they may have higher adult survival, they have a longer lifespan, they have smaller clutch sizes. So there's this idea that there's this gradient here and one of the interesting, so in the, my study species, the slate ant trike, is a quintessential tropical bird. You know, it hangs out in the tropics, it doesn't move around a lot, it's got 75% adult survival, it's got delayed reproduction, it's got high nest predation, all these kind of traits that are thought of as typical tropical traits. And one of the interesting things that has come out of Steve's study is that the parallettes show a very different pattern. They have much higher clutch sizes, so they can have four to 11 young per breeding attempt where most tropical birds have about have a clutch size of two, and they don't have as high adult survival. So these guys are on, you know, a little bit different on this span of fast, slow life history traits. But there are a few things they have in common. One is that rainfall can be a bigger driving factor in both these populations. You don't have in, in both the tropical forest, uh, in the tropical forest and in the Llanos, you don't get a lot of variation in temperature, but you get these pronounced wet and dry seasons. <coughs> Another thing that you have in common is these really extended and vari variable breeding <coughs> seasons. So this means they can have multiple breeding attempts a year. It means they can have multiple sets of offspring a year. And, uh, and it, when you start breeding, can influence the number of breeding attempts you have. So just to highlight this, in the Slady Ant Trikes, their breeding season length is anywhere from five to nine months. They can start breeding any time between January and April. And this depends upon rainfall. It ends about, their breeding season ends about August to September, and I've recorded them nesting up to 12 times in one year. So they have, they have about 85% nest predation. So they don't have, this doesn't mean they produce 12 sets of young. It just means they, basically they keep trying until they produce off, offspring. And then in the parallettes, you've got about a three to six month breeding season, depending on the year. Their, the beginning of their breeding season is highly variable, with them starting anywhere from June to August. And the end of the breeding season is September to November, and they've been recorded having it for four nesting attempts in one season. So their nest predation isn't as high, so you usually don't have to breed as many times. So what this means is that when you, you know, when you start breeding and when you're born can have significant effects on the parents in terms of the number of reproductive attempts they can have and the number of offspring they produce, but also can influence <coughs> their survival when you think about you know, whether you're breeding 10 times versus two times, that can have significant effects on survival. So as I said before, first I'm gonna be talking about Neonatal dispersal and juvenile survival in western slate ant trikes, and then I'll be talking about the parallettes. <coughs> so when we think about dispersal, dispersal is really a three-step process, right? It involves the decision to leave the natal, the natal habitat, which is immigration, and then you go through this floating period, this transient period, where you're wandering around searching for breeding habitat, and then you immigrate into new breeding habitat. And each of these different steps, these different stages, involves different decisions. Such so as the question of when to disperse, how far to disperse, and which direction to disperse in. And these different, these different questions have different costs and benefits. So in the case of when to disperse, when you think about should you delay, if you should delay disperse, delaying dispersal may increase your survival and maybe increase the type of habitat you can go, the quality of the habitat you can go into. But on the other hand, it may be costly if you're, having del, you're delaying reproduction and you're not 
you know, you're not breeding earlier. So when most people think about uh, delaying what happens when you disperse, they generally think you've got independent offspring. This means they're no longer being fed by their parents. And they're capable, so they're capable of you know, feeding themselves and taking care of themselves. You disperse away from your parents, and then you acquire a breeding site. And then there was a number of studies that started showing that, these floating, that this floating period was happening in a lot of species. So this floating is basically, basically when you're wandering around for a prolonged period of time looking for breeding habitat. And this is found to be really common in species that weren't able to acquire breeding sites. So this is true in the case of if you've got a saturated environment, if you have low territory turnover, high survival, you may, even if once you disperse, you may not be able to find a breeding opening, so you may have to float for a period of time. So there's this other pathway uh, that people don't think about as much as where you have this prolonged association with parents. So this is you become independent, you're capable, you know, you can capable of physically are capable of reproducing, but you choose to stay, <coughs> you stay with your parents for a prolonged period of time. And there's multiple pathways here. You can prolong your association, and then you can help rear offspring on the natal site. So this is in the case of cooperative breeders. Or you can prolong your association and disperse away from parents, and then acquire a breeding site. So here I've uh, put dash marks here into the floating, because one of the predicted benefits of staying with your parents is you wouldn't have to go through this costly floating period where you're wandering around looking for a breeding site. So this is known as family living, when you prolong this association with parents after you've reached independence. And most studies focus on cooperative breeders. This part here where you can look at the costs and benefits of cooperative breeding and why individuals may choose to delay reproduction and help raise, <coughs> uh, help rear the siblings. But what has been found more recently in the literature is that there's a lot more species that actually have this prolonged association without cooperative breeding. And this is thought to be a precursor to cooperative breeding. <laughs> so that, you know, what this means is basically there's, there's some benefit to staying with your parents irrespective of helping behaviors. Um, but very few studies have looked at family living in non-cooperatively breeding birds. So another question is, uh, to ask is how far and in what direction to disperse? So dispersal can be beneficial if it reduces competition, it reduces the risk of inbreeding, it may increase the kind of the habitat quality that you go into, but it can be costly in terms of traveling and unfamiliarity with the habitat. And of course these different costs and benefits may differ depending on natal traits. For example, I talked about body mass or body condition. Maybe an individual that's in really good body condition is able to uh, more easily get a breeding site nearby and is more competitive and can, and can acquire these high quality areas. So this work was done on the Western Slady Antrike. These are the females here and these are the males right here. Uh, this is kind of this background is uh, basically with the, the place I worked which is a, a tropical moist forest. And this is the limbo plot that I worked on. It is in the central Panama. It's along the, uh, this is the Panama Canal here and the limbo plot is located right here. So it's a 104 hectare study site. It was started back in the 1960s by Jim Carr and it was taken over by my PhD advisor back in the 80s and it's kind of the long-term bird plot where there's been some more community dynamic studies going on there. So first, in terms of uh, this part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about family living, natal dispersal distance and direction, and juvenile survival. So first, I'm going to be asking, when do offspring disperse from the natal territory? So first, I predicted that it would be delayed, that they would exhibit this family living behavior. And this is based on the idea that they have this year-round territoriality, and they have high adult survival. They're also high density. So this means that there's really slow territory turnover. So basically, there's nowhere for the offspring to go once they do disperse. So it might be beneficial for them to try to stay as long as they can with, with their parents. They also have delayed reproduction. Um, so in a lot of species with these slow life history traits, it's thought that delaying reproduction is beneficial and actually increases your lifetime reproductive success. So these different traits are, you know, the prediction here is that there would be benefits to remaining with parents compared to dispersing. So here's the graph showing the, the family living. So this is time to dispersal on the X here and percent of fledglings dispersing on the Y. So the first thing to see is there's huge amounts of variation when they disperse. Anywhere, anywhere from 35 days after they leave the nest up to over a year later, uh, which made for uh, incredibly long field seasons. I could never leave. 
Um, and what you see is that the, this is the mean age of independence. This is when the parents, on average, stop feeding their offspring. And this is the median age, 84 days, that when they disperse. So the majority of them, they say after the parents have stopped feeding them, so they do have this family living behavior, they are staying after independence. And then there's a certain subset of them that remain on the natal territory until the following breeding season. So throughout the, the winter until the next year. Next, I looked at what traits influence variation in the extent of family living. So I looked at renesting by parents. So remember I talked about how these are these long breeding seasons, you know, multiple breeding attempts in a year. So I predicted that there could be trade-offs between these reproductive attempts. That if you know if a parent has a first set of young and they're going to renest again, that may influence how you, how long the young can stay on the natal territory. I also looked at a number of different natal traits that I've discussed that I mentioned before: mass and fledging, which is fledging is when they leave the nest, fledge date, and number of siblings. And these different traits are often associated with uh, competitive ability in these and other species. <coughs> and then I also looked at offspring sex to see if there's any sex bias dispersal and when they do leave. So first, in terms of renesting, uh, this is these are parents that did nest again after they had their first successful brood, and these are parents who did not nest again after their first successful brood. And this is the duration of time that the first brood's offspring stayed on the natal territory. So basically, this is showing. If parents nest again, their offspring have to leave earlier than if the parents do not nest again. So that's one thing that influences how long the offspring stay with their parents. And this is an active process. Um, it's not simply the offspring choosing to leave the natal site. So this is offspring age on the X and percent of fledglings on the Y. And the black line here is the percent of young experiencing aggression. And the red line is the percent of young dispersing. So as you can see, these first couple weeks, no one's really dispersing and there's not a lot of aggression and as aggression starts to increase the percent of offspring dispersing also starts to increase so you actually see them chasing you know you'll see the parents chasing their offspring it's a very aggressive process um, where usually if i see it within a week or two the offspring will be gone from the natal territory <coughs> then i looked at these different natal traits these first four i already talked about these bottom two i looked at because uh, in sadiantrix they have strict brood division so this means that when the offspring leave the nest, the male cares for one offspring and the female cares for the other offspring. And they'll, they'll hang out as a group, but only one will feed one and the other one will feed the other one. So I looked at whether or not you know, the parent sex feeding the focal offspring mattered. So were they the same sex or opposite sex to see if there's any conflict there and also parent sex. So the only thing, although the overall model was significant, the only thing that came out was fledge date or the date that they left their nest. So here you have fledge date on the X and length of the post-fledging period on the Y. And as you can see, individuals that fledge later in the year, they can stay longer on the natal territory before they disperse. So they disperse at an older age. This is obviously related to the probability of renesting. Here we've got fledge date of the first brood on the X and the probability of having a second brood on the Y. So as you can see here, if parents, if the first nest fledged early in the breeding season, the parents always attempted another nest. They tried to have another another the second brood. But as the breeding season progressed, there's a reduced probability of them trying to have another, another set of young. Next, I looked at do offspring benefit by remaining on the natal territory longer. I predicted that there would be benefits to this family living behavior, and I looked at this in terms of, and that there would be higher offspring survival. So here's a graph showing, uh, this is based on radio transmitter birds. So the blue line here is individuals that Basically, disperse when they're older, disperse at a later age. And these are individuals that dispersed when they were younger. And this, <coughs> this side here is the entire observation period. So from the time that the transmitter was put on a bird until either the bird died or the transmitter died. And this is just the first four months after dispersal. So this includes both when, when juveniles are on and off their natal territory. So as you can see here, dispersing later, increase the probability of survival compared to if you dispersed when you were younger. And this is true even uh, when you looked at the, just the first four months after dispersal. So this basically means that these guys are older when they disperse, so it means if you disperse when you're at an older age, you have higher survival, and that's probably because your, you know, your predator detection skills, your foraging skills improve with age, and so it's leading to an increased survival during that floating period. So overall I found that there is that there is this family living behavior, but there's huge variation in the extent of family living. 
I observed that there's benefits to this family living in terms of higher offspring survival, and then it was the renesting by parents and the date that offspring left the nest, or the fledge date, that influenced how long they could stay on the natal territory for the extent of family living. Also, this is a graph that I showed before. This is, this is generally the predictions in terms of family living, and what I found is that there's no cooperative breeding, even if they stay till the next year, they're, they're not helpful. Um, and none of them, even if the ones that stay till the next year, none of them immediately disperse to acquire a breeding site. They all go through this floating period for at least a couple months. So it just seems that like there's, by staying with your parents for longer, it increases your survival during that floating period. So next part I'll be talking about dispersal distance and direction. So first, how far do individuals disperse? I predicted that they would disperse short distances in very few territories. So this is commonly what's predicted in competitive environments. It's also thought that tropical understory birds are, um, are very dispersal limited, and it's one of the hypotheses for why you see a lot of, that these, that these species are the first ones to go extinct from fragments, so it's thought that they don't go very far. And also social species tend to have a very, uh, very short dispersal distances. So I calculated two different distances. One was the observed distance, and the other was this corrected distance using the Baker method. This method basically controls for the probability of detection of longer dispersal distances. So it controls for the size of the study area, essentially. So here's a graph showing dispersal distance on the X and percent of juveniles on the Y. And what we can see in each of these bars is uh, one territory movement. So once again, there's a lot of variation with individuals dispersing anywhere from one to 14 territories away from their needle, needle site. Um, and, then there's, and then the average is about 4.7 territories which is, only, which is about 400 meters. So on average, they tend to disperse you know, fairly short distances where you see you know, more of them dispersing you know, one to three territories away. So what needle traits influence dispersal distance? I predicted that individuals that are more competitive or associated with traits that are typically more competitive would disperse shorter distances. So this would be individuals that disperse when they're older, that fledged when they were young, earlier in the year, had fewer siblings, <coughs> or a heavier mass of fledging. And I also predicted no sex bias in dispersal distance. This is based on the fact that I've seen you know, similar male and female survival rates. They disperse at the same age, and they also <coughs> engage in territory defense. So based on that, the prediction is that they wouldn't, that both sexes would benefit similarly from dispersing shorter distances. <coughs> so here I just did a, um, some linear regression, some mixed linear mixed effects models, <coughs> and this is just showing that the top models here, they're less than two delta AIC. And the main thing to note is that the two traits that came out the most important in influencing dispersal distance were age at dispersal and mass at fledging. And so here you see that age at dispersal on the X and dispersal distance on the Y. So as, as I predicted, you see that individuals that stay on the natal territory for longer disperse a shorter distance than those that uh, stay on the natal territory for a shorter period of time. So there's obviously more a huge amount of variation in these early dispersing individuals. I also found that mass at fledging was important. So here we've got body mass on the X and dispersal distance on the Y. And individuals <coughs> that are heavier at fledging, heavier at leaving the nest, disperse shorter distances than lighter individuals. I also looked at what traits influence dispersal direction. And I predicted that the sexes would differ in their direction. So typically, I base this on the fact that they don't have, they don't differ in when they disperse. They don't differ in what distance they go in. So one way to avoid inbreeding could be to disperse in different directions. So here I did circular regression, and the um, the top the top things that came out as important were age of dispersal, mass of fledging, and offspring sex. So here you can see that, uh, that the sexes tend to go in different directions, with the, fe the female is in red here and the male is in black. So they tend to differ in dispersal direction. You also see, interestingly, a relationship between the age of dispersal and direction. So younger birds that disperse when they're younger tend to go towards the south, and birds that disperse when they're older tend to go towards the north. And just so you know, this is a contiguous forest, so there are there's no obvious differences in heterogeneity. I mean, there's no obvious differences in the habitat, so it's not like they're having to cross roads or they're having to cross large um, tracts of open habitat. And so really, I think it's more you know, small-scale differences. So we see that differences in soil types between the, 
west side of the plot and the north and the east sides of the plot and some differences in the ages of the forest as well. Um, but I'll have to look more into uh, some of that small scale heterogeneity in the forest and how it influences reproductive success. Oops. You also see uh, body mass, a relationship between body mass and direction. So individuals that fledge at a heavier weight tend to go towards the west compared to individuals at a lighter weight that tend to go towards the north. So in conclusion, there's individuals typically disperse four to five territories, but there's a lot of variation in dispersal distance. And we see that in heavier individuals, ones with a higher body mass when they leave the nest, and older, older dispersers differed in their dispersal behaviors. They went in different directions and they went different distances than younger individuals and lighter individuals. And I also found that males and females tended to differ in dispersal direction. <coughs> so this is, you know, I would argue this is an underlooked mechanism, an overlooked mechanism uh, to avoid inbreeding, since most studies focus on dispersal distance or in timing of dispersal. And right now we're just uh, we just finished developing all the microsats and some preliminary genetic results are that uh, it seems to be working them going in different directions. Individuals are not mating with their close relatives. And we also are finding that there's no genetic differentiation between this study site and another study site I worked on eight kilometers away. So it seems like there is that, that these tropical birds at least are moving fairly far distances. So next in terms of juvenile survival, first I looked at what the estimates of juvenile survival are and I think they'd be lowest right after they left the nest. Uh, this is based on them having this really low mobility. No question? Yeah. I was just wondering if you could predict how priori what, how much um, genetic differentiation you should observe between those populations independent of actually measuring it just based on your observed sort of dispersal curve. I haven't gone through and done it based on the dispersal curve, but I would have predicted that there would be some differences um, based on, you know, the longest distance I found was 1.5 kilometers. And obviously 8 kilometers is much, <laughs> is much further away than what I could get from my telemetry stuff. Um, so that's the benefit of, you know, having the telemetry, I can get an N of 25, where when I do the genetics, I can actually get much farther out, because I haven't gone through like the predictions. Um, so yeah, so I predicted that they would be, uh, that they would be low survival right when they left the nest, because they've got, they can barely move, you know, they've got undeveloped wings. I can grab them off the ground uh, those first couple days after they leave the nest. So here is just showing a graph of, um, of survival rate, so they have a 48% first year survival rate. But what you see here is you see the biggest drop in survival in these first couple weeks at the nest, and then it's uh, fairly consistent throughout the rest of the uh, throughout the rest of the first year. And this is one of my recovered transmitters. So here you can see that it looks like you know maybe a raptor or something grabbed onto it um, and ate it, and it was found up in a tree. So I looked also at what natal traits influence survival. So looking at the same natal traits I've been talking about before, offspring sex, body mass, fledge date, and age of dispersal. So during the dependent period, this is the first two months after they leave the nest, um, I found that the fledge date, so the date that they left the nest, had the greatest effect, and then also body mass influenced survival. So here's a graph of this where you see this is the day zero through two out of the nest, days three through six out of the nest, and then subsequent weeks weeks you know, two through eight. So as you can see here, during the high mortality period, you have this quadratic effect of fledge date, where if you fledge in the middle of the breeding season, you have the highest survival compared to earlier late in the season. And it doesn't really matter once you get past that, that first week, once your, more, once your survival is pretty high. And you see the same with mass and fledging, that if you're heavier when you leave the nest, you have a higher probability of surviving that first week out of the nest, and that it doesn't really matter once your survival is much higher. In terms of the independent period, so this is from month two until the end of the first, till the first year, we get similar results, but we have a, you know, fledge data is coming out the most important, followed by age of dispersal, as we predict, and body mass. So here I've shown that survival is the lowest the first week out of the nest. This is when they're really immobile, they can't really move around much, they're you know, one meter off the ground hiding in a low tangle. And the date of fledging, or when they left the nest, is the most important natal trait in, in both time periods, both the dependent period and the independent period. <coughs> and predation is also the main cause of mortality. And uh, this is a really uh, neat picture that, that Patrick's dad took. That was a uh, this is one of our raptors, and this is a passerine prey that in its talons. Um, so they're one of the main predators. Some of the other common predators, 
uh, basically everything eats them. Anything that can <laughs> eats them. So we have 85% nest predation. Um, but from the, you know, on the young individuals, on the juvenile, on the, you know, weak old nest, on the weak old fledglings, and in the nest you have, you know, snake predation. You have, you know, toucans. You have, you know, uh, collar force falcons and other falcons and raptors. Uh, Kawadis and monkeys will also reach into our nests and are able to get, you know, probably a couple day old fledglings, the uh, aracaris. Um, and then probably on the independent juveniles, it's more likely going to be snakes and some of these raptors. This collared forest falcon will actually can run on the ground chasing after its prey in addition to doing it in the flying around through the forest. Um, so they're pretty, pretty aggressive. So overall, I found that there are these benefits of family living. There is uh, higher survival and shorter dispersal distances if you stay on the natal territory for longer compared to dispersing when you're younger. There is also similar costs and benefits of dispersal distance and family living in both males and females. And instead what we see is there's this difference in dispersal direction between the sexes. So this could be a mechanism to avoid inbreeding. I also found that there's these different silver spoon effects of early conditions. So the mass that you had in the nest and when you left the nest have these long-term effects on your dispersal and also your survival. Okay, so I've shown that you know that basically data fledging had a really big effect during the <coughs> on offspring during for their natal dispersal and their juvenile survival. So now I'm going to be focused basically on the same trait but looking at it from the adult perspective and talking about selection. So when we think about selection studies, this is what what most people think of. You've got you know your trait here. You've got some positive or negative relationship with relative fitness. And when people think about fitness, there's a you know, number of different fitness metrics people can use. So you may be talking about fecundity, so this may be your number of, the number of offspring you have. Um, or you could be talking about adult survival. And so these two, you know, these two fitness metrics are very rarely studied you know, in one species and in, one, in regards to one trait. You know, but they're really, for reproductive traits, What's predicted is that, you know, is that fecundity and survival would actually trade off with each other. So the idea here is, let's say clutch size, you know, what influences, if you have more offspring, that may increase your fecundity, but at the expense of your own survival. So there's this, you know, idea with, in life history theory that there should be a trade off between, you know, adult survival and fecundity. But, you know, but very few studies when they look at reproductive traits, they focus on both of these. So what, what this leads to is that you might see some, you know, most studies of, let's say on time and breeding, you find a negative relationship here where, you know, fecundity is, fecundity declines over the, over the breeding season. And then they would predict, therefore, that you should see a change in the, in the date of breeding. But they usually don't, you know, one of the reasons they may not find, you know, a positive, a positive and negative directional selection is going to lead to an actual change in the trait distribution is if they're ignoring these different trade-offs. So this will make more sense from what I just said. So let's say you've got, you've got relative fitness here and a trait, and you have positive selection on it. What you expect to see is you expect to see that the trait distribution is going to shift to the right over time, right? But in a lot of studies of reproductive traits, you're actually, you're not seeing this shift. You're seeing, in most cases, no change in the actual trait distributions. So one potential reason is because there may be this opposing selection between viability and fecundity. Another reason that you might see some obscuring of your results is there can be fluctuating selection. So a good example of this is in the Darwin's finches where you see with each year you can see you know, changes in between positive and negative selection. So that although in one year you may see positive directional selection, overall you know, there may abs over across the whole study there may actually be no absolute change um, because you're getting this fluctuating selection. So when I think about patterns of selection, uh, people talk about, you know, there's directional linear selection that I've talked about where you have an increase or decrease in fitness. The trait, there's also stabilizing nonlinear selection where you have the peak in fitness is in the middle. Disruptive nonlinear where the peaks in fitness are on the sides. And then you have correlational selection where there's, uh, where there's two traits that are influencing each other. And I'm not going to go into correlational selection much other than to say I looked at both egg mass and date of birth and clutch size and date of birth and found that there's no correlational selection. And I also found that there's weaker selection on clutch size and egg mass than, than date of birth or than onset of breeding. So 
Although a lot of studies, especially in birth, focus on the number of young who breed and attempt an egg mass, what we're actually seeing here is that it's, it's the date of when you breed that has greater effects. So onset of breeding, so when I say this, I mean, you know, their first breed, when they have their first breeding attempt. So this can mean that when you have your first breeding attempt can influence the number of breeding attempts you have throughout that year. Um, so this is the date of the first, of your first nest, basically. And this can have long-term effects on individuals. It can influence population growth. It can influence the number of breeding attempts you have. Um, and in temperate species, there's this, there's this general seasonal decline here. So you see that if you breed earlier in the year, you have higher fecundity, basically. You have higher relative fitness. And then later in the year, there's a, there tends to be this decline. So this is in temperate species, this is usually associated with a, um, a, a rapid decline in food availability. You know, there's these short breeding seasons. You often only individuals breed for a month or two of the year. Um, and it has to do with food availability. And so you'll see breeding in the beginning of the year is much like, more likely to increase your fecundity. But in, a, you know, in tropical species where you may breed up to six plus months in a year, uh, you may not see such a rapid decline in food availability. So it may be, you may see some different patterns. So this is looked at in the green room, I looked at this in the green room to parallettes. They're located here, and as I said, this was a, um, this is, you know, you know, kind of a picture of the Venezuelan Llano, so you can see it's a very different environment than uh, the work I did on slating ant trikes. And this is a, uh, a picture of the study site here. So you can, this is, uh, there's two different populations in Venezuela um, that are only separated 600 meters apart, but they have big differences in sex ratio and breeding density and a number of other demographic traits. <coughs> so first I'm going to talk about patterns of viability and fecundity selection and drivers of selection and observed patterns, if I have time. So first is just the main thing to take from this is that there's huge fluctuating selection. So the, the strength and direction of selection can go, uh, you know, can go up in one year, it can be negative in the next year, um, the strength can change from year to year, and this is, and it differs between the two different populations. So I don't go into detail here other than to say, depending upon the year, you can have negative linear selection, positive linear selection, disruptive selection, or stabilizing selection. So there's a huge amounts of fluctuation over these, these 22 years. But the main thing that you see is you see this opposing selection. So this means that, as I, as I predicted, that typically you've got negative linear selection on fecundity, so on. Here I'm looking at two different metrics of reproduction, the number, that, number of offspring that accrue to the breeding population and the number of offspring that leave your nest that fledge. So here there's generally, it's, this is generally negative, there's negative directional selection. And then on viability or adult survival, there's positive selection. So that's what the pluses and minuses mean, that there's basically opposing selection. So in most years you see positive viability selection and negative linear selection, negative fecundity selection. So what that means is that breeding earlier in the year produces more offspring, but breeding later in the year increases your adult survival. And if we look at this across the whole 22 years, we see a similar pattern where we see this negative linear selection on number of fledged young and number of recruited offspring. And in terms of adult survival, you see a slightly nonlinear relationship here where breeding earlier in the year reduces your adult survival and it peaks, you know, your survival peaks if you breed towards the second part of the, of the breeding season. So in general, there's temporal variation, you see this fluctuating annual selection, there's spatial variation, there's these differences between the populations, and most importantly, there's this opposing viability of fecundity selection. <coughs> So in terms of the drivers of selection, I looked at competition for mates, so that was sex ratio. Competition for nest sites so is basically the breeding density or the percent of occupied nest boxes. And then I looked at rainfall as another potential driver. So this is based on rainfall during the uh, dry season, so that's uh, right before they start breeding. Um, but that's strongly correlated with annual rainfall. And in this population, uh, sex ratio has been associated with survival and population growth. Another work in rainfall has been associated with uh, food density or seed density. So as far as my predictions, I predicted in terms of viability selection that competition for mates and competition for nest sites would come out as more important drivers. And in terms of fecundity selection, that rainfall would be a more important. So I did the ASC model selection on this, and I found that for fecundity, uh, rainfall was what came out as most important. 
um, on the number of fledged young. And what you see here is that in basically this means in wetter years, which is that side there, that you have stronger selection to breed earlier in the year. We don't. I did not find any relationship between any of my three drivers and, uh, and selection on the number of recruited offspring. So what this probably means is that you know potentially in wetter years. You, have, you may have a greater decline in seed density and food availability, and that would maybe pushing, the, um, pushing it so it's more important to breed earlier in the year for the offspring. For viability selection, um, we see that both breeding density and sex ratio came out in the top models. So here we can see that lower density, um, if it's a lower density, there's stronger selection on survival to breed later in the year. And if you have a lower, um, a more female bias sex ratio, there is stronger selection to um, also breed later in the year. So what this probably has to do with is the number of breeding attempts. So here, if you if it's a lower density, there's um, females can you know produce more can have more breeding attempts in that year, and that may that may reduce your adult survival the more breeding attempts you have. Similarly, here you've got increased competition between the females, and that may uh, make it so that it's if you breed more times in a year that that can reduce your survival. So overall, there, I found that during wetter years, there's fecundity selection was stronger. During years where the females have more competition for mates, viability selection is stronger. And there's also, during lower breeding density years, viability selection is stronger. <coughs> so finally, just quickly looking at the observed trends in time interbreeding. Here, this is uh, what's actually happening to the population. So this is here on the X, and we have the standardized selection differentials on the Y which is just basically the change in onset of breeding from one year to the next. And what we can see here is that in the two populations, uh, that this is fluctuating back and forth, which means that it's being pushed you know, earlier, you know, onset of breeding is being pushed earlier in the year, and it's being pushed back later in the year. Uh, or sorry, this is earlier in the year, this is back later in the year. So there's a lot of annual fluctuation, which is what we'd expect based on what we found with our selection gradients. But overall, what we're seeing, even though there's this temporal variation, we're seeing that onset of breeding has actually been pushed back over time since the beginning of the study. And this is true in, in both the populations, um, you're seeing this pushback. So what could be happening here is that one thing we're also seeing is that breeding density has declined over time. So the lower breeding density increases your viability selection. So this means that there's stronger selection to breed later in the year. So that what could be one reason we're seeing that individuals are breeding later than they used to. And we also see that on an annual basis, viability selection is much is stronger than fecundity selection. So there may just be this kind of you know, this gradual pushback um, so that individuals are breeding later in the year. And also just one more quick thing we see. So we've got, um, as I said, we've got you know strong selection to breed early on fecundity. We have strong selection to breed later on viability. And what individuals are actually doing is a combination of these strategies, it appears like. We've got one group of birds that tends to start breeding early in the year, and another group of birds that starts breeding later in the year. So these guys are increasing their fecundity, and these guys are increasing their adult survival. Um, so there seems to be these two different strategies going on in the population. So finally, there's I found opposing viability and fecundity selection, different drivers of selection on fitness metrics, and that you know, in temperate regions, you're seeing some advancing of, um, of onset of breeding due to temperature, where here it seems to be more demographic traits that are actually pushing the onset of breeding backwards. And we also found these long-term effects of these early conditions where data breeding on, you know, in both the western slaty antrike and the parallettes influence adult and offspring survival, adult reproductive success, and offspring dispersal. And from the from the antrike perspective, breeding in the middle of the breeding season ended up increased their survival. If you breed, if if they're born too early, they were kicked off from their natal territory earlier, or if they uh, were born too late, then there's a higher probability of predation. Where from the parallettes, from the adult perspective, you see this opposing selection, where you actually end up having one group of birds starting to breed early, and the other group starting to breed later. So you've got these two different strategies. And that's it. Sorry, I had to speed up there at the end. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Maybe if I could start, at the end there you talk about these two different strategies. Mm -hmm. Are those strategies heritable? Mm -hmm. I don't know, we haven't looked at the heterogeneity in that. I mean, timing of reading is heritable. But as far as whether or not you keep that same uh -huh. trait, that's, that's there is some um, there is some age dependence to that. So if you're an older breeder, you tend to go here, which makes sense, right? Maybe you're you're favoring your fecundity over your survival, mm -hmm. and if you're a younger breeder, you tend to go here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what it seems like. It's the most we've seen so far of that grouping is based on age, and the, you know older birds favor their fecundity, and younger birds favor their survival. Just being predictable. Other questions? Did you see a, a, like a sex bias with recruiting back onto territories? No, nothing. The only thing we got was direction. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing in uh, you know age at reproduction, all that stuff. It's all the same between the sexes. Other questions? So I may have missed it, but the, how does the you got this interannual fluctuation in you know, direction and magnitude of selection mm -hmm. on both traits. And in Darwin's finches, that was clearly related to El Nino and La Nina mm -hmm. right. oscillations. Is there anything like that going on here? Well, I mean, the thing that we, you know, that seems to be related to rainfall, sex ratio, and breeding density, I mean, that's what's kind of, you know, pushing it back and so forth. Is you find more rainfall, rainfall was... There would be stronger selection to breed earlier when there's more rainfall mm. on fecundity. Is that, is that for both populations or just one? That's for both. The both populations came out as similar. There's no, um, there was a population effect, but there's no interaction between them. And by breeding early, do they breed longer? Have they have more breeding attempts. Yeah. So they can, yeah, they increase the fecundity because they can breed four times versus yeah. so one or two times. Productivity is higher than we can. Right, right. So that, you know, you predict with climate change, if it dries up, less breeding attempts in a year. Which goes the population size. And, and has there been any trends in, in precipitation patterns? There hasn't, yeah. There hasn't been any overall, you know, change. Mm. Only the density. Did you ever have data on egg mass relative to egg number? We do. There's, um, for the parallettes, the, I have to remember what the pattern is. They basically have really strong hatching asynchrony. And so what you get is, you get the ones in the, the egg mass of the individuals in the middle basically are all the same, where the first ones that are the lightest, the first ones to hatch, and the last ones are the And then over the season for those that do double brood and those that do not, did, the, did egg mass relative to number change? Was, it, was the profile no. for each breeding attempt the same? Yeah, there's really, there's no difference in clutch size throughout the breeding season, and there's not really much of a difference in egg mass. mass yeah, eggs. I don't think so, no. Um, with your Panama birds, did you, so you said that the, the young actually do better if they hang out with their parents longer. Mm -hmm. Is it because the parents warn them about predators or is there some, what's the advantage like from predators with their, with the parents? Well, they get to travel, they travel in flocks when they're with their parents. Yeah. Um, so they're part of this mi mixed species flock where when they're by themselves, they basically hide out 30 meters up and try to not to bug anyone. Um, so it just seems to be that they're just... They're not as able to forage, and they're, you know you get the advantages of being in a flock, basically. And when they're with their parents, yeah, I mean the parents, you know, if you have a group, you basically have a group effect. But. Other questions? Well, thank you. That was a, a, a massive amount of field work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much.